A ship called the American Dream, a very unimportant ship, rusty and tired from plowing slowly from place to place with ordinary cargoes of baled waste paper, coal, soap, lumber, was put up for sale to be wrecked on the 40th birthday of George Paraskis. Somehow this particular ship with its poetic name touched him, for Paraskis was no ordinary junk man. He believed in a cosmic scheme of things in which his trade was an honorable and essential part. Steel was not a heavy, cold, hard substance to Paraskis. It was the work and sweat of Minnesota ore miners, the cramp and dark a mile deep in Pennsylvania coal mines, the roar and flame of Pittsburgh blast furnaces. And the cities men made with steel seemed to George to die away part by part. And then his job began. Cutting away the dead and worn out things, breaking them down into raw material, ready to be forged into new things again. He felt himself as a force in the world, wrecking the old, making it new. Thus, he saw the American dream, a broken, dirty hulk, unsafe to take to sea, but ready to be cut up, rebuilt, and launched again. So he climbed her mast to where he could look down on the seagulls, where there was nothing but wind, and dreamed. I got it in the harbor. A beautiful thing. I climbed all over it. Rourke is screaming. We ought to get our crew out of his way. We're two men short. You were dressed in your coat and tie, and you're out talking to the seagulls. Listen, they got carved mahogany paneling in all the cabins. Brass fittings that'll go out a pound a piece in all the bathrooms. Mermaids and dolphins, things you'll never see again. I found a man in the Bronx that'll give us five tons of brick, cleaned and scraped. We can't make a better bargain than that. Listen, Abbas, I'm telling you. They got a list of beautiful things. It don't even show in the inventory. For the 20th time, no. No. Not a chance. A little salvage operation and you want to take a rocket to the moon? An idealist? If it wasn't for me, you'd starve. I'll be up there with the seagulls eating wind. Once in his life. Apples once. A man has to try to do something bigger than himself. Know your place. You've got dirt in your hands that'll never wash. I'm trying to tell you a thing about myself that's simple and clean and... Why do you have to talk to her? Why? Look at me. I'm filthy. I'm dirty. So are you. And don't deny it. We're both junk men, George. We're gonna die, junk men. A hundred thousand dollars for ships. Five cents a brick. That's who you are. Taking the kid to the hospital again. I wondered if later on you could go on over and see him. Yeah. <laughs> he don't know no other kid, you know. But man, Maury will slide in there, and it, <laughs> he couldn't care like seeing you. All right, my lord. I'll do that. Good. The first conscious wrongful act done by George Paraskis to his fellow man was murder. What followed for him was put in words some 200 years ago by Thomas de Quincey in an essay entitled, Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts. Quote, if once a man indulges himself in murder, very soon he comes to think little of robbing, 
And from robbing, he next comes to drinking and Sabbath breaking. And from that, to incivility and procrastination." Unquote. This guy lives here all alone, and uh, the newspapers go back three days, and nobody's seen him. So I go down to Mrs. Adamalovich, and I call his office, and his partner says he hasn't been to work. So I come back here and bust in the door and look through his joint, and he's not there. So I use his phone to call the precinct. Have any of you people seen or heard from the man who lives in this house in the past three days? Do you know if he's taking a trip? Can you tell me uh, if he has any friends or relatives? Take me in, John. Will you? and Detective Flint, 65th Squad. Oh. Well, I'm his business partner. We had this uh, scrap at salvage yard. Somebody called me. That was me. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Paraskis, we were hoping you could help us. Me? I've, I've never been in Apple's house before. Huh? Apple's? Yeah. You know, on his way to work, he'd always stop for an apple. He picked up the bruised ones for half price. And uh, that was his lunch. His real name was Jerome. When did you see him last? I see, it was uh, a couple of days ago, I think. Uh, Tuesday, yeah. Travel magazines. Did he travel a lot? No, apples. <laughs> Even in the army, he was always in New York. Did he change lately? Did he act differently in any way? No, like he always was. take off like this before? No. Mr. Paraskis, why didn't you report him missing? <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't think, you know. I, I really figured he would show up, you know. Alexander High, 1923. All our love to our son, Samuel. Our Freddy. The Lord took him to his heart, May 9, 1944. Did you ever meet any of his family? No, he never had any family. He came out of an orphanage. You know that your father loves you no matter what he may say, as he always has a hard time showing his feelings. And I think that has been hard on both of you. But he gets very down at times, and then he asks about you. And we remember very good times when we were all a family together. 
This is Jean Fenton. Mail 1906. Gee. Hey, that was an old lady we tore down our house. Boy, he must have been lonely. He's made a family of his own from the odds and ends of other people's lives. Mr. Paraskis, what do you want us to do? Want you to do? What do you mean? Well, if you want us to look for him, somebody has to sign a missing persons report. Why me? There isn't anyone else. Oh. Hey, who's going to take care of these birds? Look at them, they're hungry. Well, we can, we can call the Humane Society. That was like a joke, you know. I mean, everybody calling him apples. <laughs> You know, my wife wouldn't even let him in the house. You know what she used to call him? The junk man. You said used to. You sound as if you never expect him to come back. Yeah, well, it's his house, you know. It was like nobody ever lived here. It's a magpie's nest. You know what they say? They say if you touch a bird's nest, it never comes back to it again. It looked funny, wouldn't it, if nobody even complained? I mean, a man walks right off the face of the earth and nobody even takes the trouble to look for him. Pretty sad to be that lonely. All right, I'll sign it. I'll sign it. Play with Detective Flint. Pardon me, Mike. I gotta talk to you. Everybody's talking. Everybody in the 65th precinct has opened their big mouths and begun to talk all at once. You remember that side in the call? Names don't mean nothing on a day like this. Well, I think I got a homicide. Give it to me fast. A couple of days ago, this guy just dropped out of sight. Now, he's a very careful man, Mike. Yet he didn't take the time to, to cancel his milk or his newspapers or any of his utilities. He has no friends, no family, no social life. Adam, we've got a missing persons bureau. Missing persons bureau? This man has, has nobody to run from. Nobody to run to. The man is a recluse. Adam, give me a suspect, a motive, something to hang a crime on. All right. A few hours ago, I was going through his house with his business partner. Now, the man was very upset. I'm sure he's bugged about something. What's he looking for, insurance? No, he has no insurance. No will, no heirs. So investigate. Give me something. Give me a suspect, a corpus, a believable motive. It's easy, Adam. Police work is easy once you get the hang of it. Now, everybody, quiet down. George? What's wrong? I came home early. I wanted to talk to somebody. Well, you certainly came at the right time. Uh, I'm just full of plans. Look, I've, I've found a new apartment. Oh, listen, Grace. You know they can't find apples. I just came from the police. Oh? Uh, well, uh, look, Muffin, y you'll have your own personal study here. And, uh, and here's a writing corner for Grace. me. Grace. You know something? You know, I never knew that apples were so empty. I mean, uh, you wouldn't believe it. He stole other people's mail to read like it was his own. Look, George, th then there is this guest room that we'll be able to fix up for the kids. The neighborhood is full of kids, George. Good-looking kids. <laughs> and nurses. 
pushing baby carriages. <laughs> Grace, do you know the difference between a man and an animal? Why don't you want to move? Oh, Grace, what's the use of it? We've lived in how many? 25, 30 apartments? All right, can you remember what number five was like? Yes, but that's the whole point, George. You see, in this place, there's going to be room for everything. And, um, and there's going to be light in every room. And there'll be a, a bathroom for the child. What child? Now, look, Grace. I don't want you to fool around. I want to buy that ship for salvage. Now, I can't afford to move right now. I can't stand this place anymore, George. I just can't. George, listen. George, the, the, the new place has, has so many features that this place oh, never Oh, it's had. the same thing all over. Look, Muffin, I'm scared. I'm going to be 40 soon, and I, I won't be able to afford to have my own children. Lots of women over 40 have children. Lots of women die having children. All right, you still got your books that you wrote. Yes, I... I've got my books. I, I've got my child's Greek myths and my child's version of the scriptures and my child's Chaucer and my child's version of the classics. I, I have all those books. I, I make little ones out of big ones. I throw my life away doing that. Well, you made me happy. I should have... I should have adopted a child from the beginning. There wasn't enough money in the beginning. Oh, no, no, I couldn't... I couldn't find the right place. I... C I couldn't... Uh, no, no apartment was right for the children. Oh, Grace. Oh, George, I know, I know, I know. I'm just a barren, tiresome woman without any friends, hmm? Oh, look, Muffin. I haven't got anything in the whole world except you. Tell me. Please tell me. Please. hollering we don't clean up in two days, he's gonna move in a bulldozer and clean up himself. Am I supposed to work on that brick for the man in the Bronx or what? I mean, with apples gone and all, all that... All right, look, uh, just work on the metal suit. What's the suit for? Oh, I was up seeing the kid. They're gonna have to go in and operate. I'll go look in on him. Hey, you know he still remembers that 10th birthday party you threw for him in the hospital? That was a nice thing. Well, it was fun. All his life in a hospital bed. Why does it have to happen? You know what I feel sometimes, Billard? I feel that God has left us and we're blundering around in the streets. Why? Hey. Hey, you feel okay? What do you figure? Is Apple's coming back? I don't know. Look, go on up and see the boy. He never stops talking about you. Thanks. You can't get this all done by yourself. George said let the bricks go and get this pipe out. I can't hire on. Billy Jeffers. Two days, my look. Yeah, that's me. Detective Flint, 65th Squad. Yes, sir. Mr. Jeffers, we have a complaint that Jerome Seidner is missing. According to our reports, he, uh, he left for work last Saturday morning, and he was last seen when he started work that morning with you. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. About 8.15. Uh-huh. What happened after that? Well, 
We went to work. I was done on the other side getting out some ornamental iron work. Apples was working on a brick wall over there. Did you see him working over there? Oh, I can't remember. I was working at a pretty good clip myself. Well, did you see him leave? No. Was there anybody else working over there? I went up there to talk to George Paraskis. Well, did you see Seidner then? No. What time was that? Oh, about 10 o'clock. Didn't you find that a little unusual? <laughs> no. He'd take off in the middle of a job any time to scout a new one or see a man. Weren't you concerned that in case he was hurt or something fell on him? No. I didn't think of it. Where did you say he was working? On that wall over there, getting out brick. Let's go over and take a look, huh? Aren't you coming with me? Rock will do it. I've got to get this pipe out. just be put down here to freeze in the winter and sweat in the summer. Is there some reason for everything or isn't there? I can't explain it. But that ship, even the name, the American dream, gives you a kind of a lift, like a good promise. Maybe he doesn't even want to let me the money. No, George, you give me the jitters. Ruth. Never before in my life have I spent the whole afternoon in a bar <laughs> beefing about my life. Now that woman suffers, it isn't her fault. You've got your needs. You've got to have somebody you can talk to. George Baraskis. Yeah, I'm George Brassus. Uh, you quest? Yeah. You used to put up dough for my partner, Jerome Seidner. Yeah, apples. <laughs> Cheap guy. Always eating rotten apples for lunch. Look, I want to borrow $25,000. That's a lot of money, George. You got money in bank accounts. Why don't you go to them? They'll go $10,000 on my collateral, but I got to have more. What about Seidner? Where's he? Now we don't know what he took off. That <laughs> apple is always cheap. So now you're on to something big, huh? What is it? There's a ship in the harbor. I can't explain it, but I went down to look at it. I figure it's time I stopped digging around in garbage cans and I did something big. Like wrecking a beat-up old coast freighter? Well, for one thing, we could take it apart and make something new out of it. Yeah. And maybe you figure you'll put in a low bid in one of the big scrapyards and buy out, eh? Huh? A little blackmail type action? I want that ship. That apples, he was always a cheapie. <laughs> Look, a down payment of $35,000. The rest in monthly installments. Now, the first month, 
We tear out all the electrical wiring there. Buses, the transformers. There's maybe eight, ten tons of copper in that. It'll take care of the first months of storm. Now then, uh, we strip out all the bronze and brass fittings. We cut the steel plate and the scrap. We lift it in the barges. Then we cut the deck out over the engine room, lift out the turbines. Now we got an empty hull. We cut that down to the waterline. Then we uh, maybe have to rent a dry dock for a week. And we cut up the bottom. You sure got it all figured out. I can raise 10 bills. I need 25 more. How much do you figure they'll pay off for it, GB? OK, have it your way. I'll get my money back and maybe 10, 15,000. I just lent you 25 and kept out my 3,000 interest in advance. I gotta have cash for payrolls, payments, crane rentals, a million things. You hold out money from your employees for income tax, don't you? So use it. There's a million ways, GP. Don't eat any rotten apples. Maybe he just headed for the boondocks. Apples? Suddenly you're on a first-name basis with all the characters in this hypothetical mystery melodrama. Okay, Seidner. Mike, at about 8.15, Seidner and Miller Jeffers, the foreman, went to work over there. And at about 10 o'clock, Paraskis came along and he talked to Jeffers. But they didn't see Seidner, and he hasn't been seen since then. And nobody's bothered to look through the wreckage. Have you talked to Paraskis about that? I will when I find him. Oh, he's gone too. Well, I don't, I don't think he's running. I think he's just looking for somebody to talk to, Mike. Remember I told you that was the first thing I noticed when I saw him at Seidner's house? Looked like a man who was bothered by something. Looked like he wanted to talk to somebody. Well, go find him, Adam. I want to have a talk with him. say why only cattle live on wind and scenery, and it was a hard winter. This trail boss, he was a big German from Fredericksburg in Texas. He wore a hard derby hat, he was a cowboy with a German accent. Oh, he caused a lot of comment. Oh, Detective Flint, <laughs> want you to meet Robbie. Robbie, this gentleman is Detective Flint. Hello, Robbie. He says hello. You found apples? Yes, at the wreckage. Ah. Well, Robbie, I better be running along. I'll see you a little later on. Oh, what happened to the big trail boss? Well, as a matter of fact, there was an incident. We got in a place where there were some men. Mule skinners, they were. They had this old smooth-mouthed jackass that they bet nobody could ride. Well, this trail boss in the derby hat, he took the dare. Well, sir, he got one foot over, and this jackass threw him across the street. Oh, heck, he says, I could ride him if I could only get on him. So I held this jackass's ears, pulled his head down on my chest, held him tight. Old Dutch, he pulled down his derby hat and climbed aboard. 
and I let him go. Well, he went higher than I ever saw a man fly and come down on that derby hat. Jammed it tight over his ears. <laughs> we had to cut it off with his razor. But the mule skinners, they were nice men, and they, they paid off like they lost, see? Because they figured they had six dollars worth of fun just seeing that. And that was all in the old days up in Cheyenne. So I'll see you later, huh? Bye-bye. Was George there? He found the body. They say the boy's too weak to operate. We can't even do that now. George has got to hurry. I came around, pointed to the body, and walked into the night. Through half the police department. He showed up himself and offered to help us. He was there three, four hours working right with us. How was I to figure that he was going to take off like that? I turned my back and he's gone. That's good police work. Did Paraskis and Seidner ever have words between them? No more than anyone else in this business. Then what you're saying is they did have their differences. Yes, sir. Did they, uh, did they argue lately? Same old thing. Nothing special. But Millard, did they ever have a fist fight? No. George had never lifted his hand to anyone. And this is a tough business. Well, what were some of the things that they, they argued about lately? Well, this ship George wanted to buy. He always wanted first class. Apples was afraid. Did you kill Sadler? No, sir. You didn't like him very much, did you? No. Okay, Millen. If we need any more information, we'll call you. Sometimes you wonder, how could they just let him walk away? I think you're pushing this a little hard, Mike. We still don't have a case against him. May I recall your own words? A man everybody loves, a man everybody trusts, a man with the lid screwed down tight, his partner disappears, he's like the lid is off. He's buying ships. He throws away 25 years of habit. He's so impatient he doesn't show up for work. He's like a man broken apart with a secret he can't tell. Those are your own words. But Mike, there's another possibility. His partner's gone, so he's free to make a deal for the ship. His wife objected, and so he, he got fed up and he walked out. See, he wasn't necessarily running. He was just very busy handling a, handling a two-man business. When he heard we were digging for the body, he came back and helped. That's a big risk to take, finding the body himself. Frank, step in here a minute, will you? Yes, sir. How long have you known me, Frank? Fifteen years, give or take. And you've always known me as a hard-nosed cop? Right out of the rule book. Names, numbers, dates, procedure. Facts you write in your report and cross-check. Have I got an imagination? Well, Mike, if you put it like that... Have I got a solid reputation as a square? What kind of a police officer is Adam? Adam? Yeah, Adam. What do they say about him? Adam? The college cop, huh? He uses reports. He gets the facts all right, but he uses his head. He sizes people up. He's a psychologist. He's a very intelligent kind of a man. Yeah, Adam's like that. And he's got a very good insight and understanding of human behavior. But I got some news for you. I got a hunch. Paraskis is Gilly. Don't ask me how I know. I feel it in my bones. Wait a minute, Mike. Why did he make it a point to hunt for the body himself? Nobody would have blamed him for sitting on the sidelines. He was running around the streets because... And you said so yourself, and I'm surprised at you. 
He was trying to get hold of himself. He was trying to come to grips with his problems. He was facing reality. And when he dug into the busted concrete and faced the body, he accepted his guilt. Maybe. I want to talk to this man. I don't want him to rest easy with his guilt. I want him to know there's a man in this city who knows and who never intends to let him rest. And don't look so surprised I've got a brain. Adam, there's one thing I don't want you ever to lose. Your sense of what people are like. Strangers on the wall, reading other people's mail at night. Ah, they say speak no evil of the dead, but here's one dead man whose presence poisoned us all when he was alive. Hey, Miller! Visiting hours are over today. I'll go up and see him tomorrow. I gotta get that ship first. But uh, I want you to do me a favor and get him. He don't care nothing about that. He wants to see you. Well, sure. You were never like this in your life, offering money. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking of my kid in that bed for the rest of his life and it drums in my ears. What kind of God lets this happen? There's got to be some good in his life. And you're going to give me two bucks for a jigsaw puzzle. You were never like that in your life. All right, I said I'd go up and see him. Now get out. The police are looking for you. I'm good for it, Quist. I got a top reputation. Not anymore, Cheapy. You used to, but now nobody can figure you. I haven't got the money. Yeah, I know it. George down to his level for years and and then there was this um, a great opportunity and hope for George and uh, for the first time the uh, junk man wasn't in the way Mrs. Praskis did your husband kill his partner George uh, George um, asked him to dinner uh, one night <laughs> and uh, I, I couldn't keep my eyes off his hands. I don't think he'd washed in years. Uh, kill him? Uh, no, 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 no. George couldn't even uh, drop him from the business. Do you know where your husband is now? Uh, oh, no, no, I, uh, I, I, I've never been the kind of uh, a woman who uh, always had to follow her, her husband around, like an electric eye. No, I've, I've, I never did that. Uh, no, he, he had his retreat, and, and I had my, my, my books, and 
that's that's the the way it should be, don't don't you think so? Mrs. Paraskis, what we'd like to ask you is where these retreats might be. Oh, I I never asked into that. Uh, no, I, I always had a respect for um, for his his need for privacy. All right, Mrs. Paraskis. Thank you very much. Oh. You can go now. Oh, oh, all right. Don't you understand? It's all done. It's all done. You don't come home, I will kill myself, George. I will. I will. I swear I will. <laughs> I don't know what people... <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know how they take 50 or 60 pills, how they swallow them, but I, I will. Maybe, maybe I'll use a razor blade, too. Look, don't maybe discuss I these things with me. It's only a big threat. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. You only use it like a whip and a leash. I swear I will do yeah. it. So help me God, you will never forget it if I do it. What? What? Your death and my conscience? <laughs> come on, Grace, come on. Look, I'm through. Do you understand? It's all over. Can't you get that through your head? It's all done. It's finished. I gave, and I gave, and I gave. Well, now I'm going to get myself. I'm going to fill myself up. And I ain't ashamed of it. What was I appointed? The saint of the world or something? Now. Look, I was the kid who always pulled the sacks of kittens out of the river. Well, now I'm throwing them all back. All back. That's me. about that, did you? Hmm? I didn't know. Hey, Ruth. How many drinks has she had? to you? I had a fight. But I got the ship. I got that great big black whale of a ship. Ruth, forgive me. For what? Never mind. <laughs> forgive me. Sure, honey. You don't ask for anything back to you, Ruth. You just forgive it. <laughs> it's gonna be okay, George. It's gonna be all right. What's that? What's that? Grace thinks she's kidding. Come on, Grace, get out. Get out, it's all over.
Now, we got to see first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. Robbie? Oh, that's all right. What do you mean it's all right? You've been after me to see him. Well, George, he died last night. Robbie died? Yeah. Is that all you got to say? What more to say than that? You think he wasn't going to die? But I was going to go up to see him. He couldn't wait. All right, what is that supposed to mean? Nothing, Mr. Tarascus. I admit it, I... I don't understand you. Your kid just died and here you are back to work? Well, I gotta do something. I was gonna go up and see him, but... it just wasn't any time. Oh, it wasn't none of your affair. Just got fond of you, that's all. It wasn't your fault. What do you mean, fault? Are you, are you accusing me? No. I feel sorry for you. Don't feel sorry. I, I don't want you feeling sorry for me. You don't want to see me around, you fire me, Mr. Paraskis. But first you pay up for all the time you owe. I don't owe you a thing. I don't owe anybody. I can't pay anybody. I've been supporting all of you. I took all I could. That's true, George. He was a good man. Don't judge me. You're doing that yourself. And don't threaten me. Hey, Miller. I killed apples. Don't make no difference to me. Once a man indulges himself in murder, very soon he comes to think little of robbing. And from robbing, he next comes to drinking and Sabbath breaking. And from that, to incivility and procrastination. Such was the fate prescribed for George Paraskis by an 18th century sage, Thomas de Quincey. St. Louis for the shoe show, right? How long did you say you know this lady? Detective Flint? I, uh, want you to understand. I'm turning myself in for the killing of Jerome Seidner. But it's not because I feel guilty. But I kept putting off. Putting off. Ed Millard's kid is dead. Do you understand that? There are eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them.
This has been a Screen Gems film presentation. Herbert B. Leonard, executive producer.